Oh, uh, all right, I'm going to make one more attempt to shove this thing out of the way, but this is, all right. So you can have functional paths where every, every request goes to the same URL and you have parameters down here that specify like transfer from account to account, amount equals. So the page will have different content, but it's all the same URL. And that's another thing that, of course, will be Fuddle, an automated scanner. And you'll have some kind of functional path where you log in, and then you can select a payee and transfer funds and log out. And it's all done with the same URL. So the one-to-one uh, -one mapping between URL and content doesn't hold, and that's going to hold up, mess up the whole logic of a spider, where you want to have like one answer for each URL. And so there can be hidden parameters. You can try adding debug equals true in the hopes that somebody has a debug version. Uh, that's a good one, or test or hide. Uh, Burp Intruder can do that automatically. Uh, so when you're hunting around the, you just hunt around the app and try to see what it does. Find the core functionality, whatever it's really supposed to do. If it's a banking app, figure out how to view your balance and move money and stuff. Um, look for things that go off to other sites that might still have authenticated content. Um, Error messages are very handy. People very often have error messages that tell you things you really shouldn't know. And look at the main stuff, of course. Session control, access control. How do you really have to authenticate before you get to the management page? How do they maintain a session? What does the token look like? That sort of thing. And of course, anything to do with that is, is a high, high value item. If you can find some kind of flaw in the password change or account recovery system, you can get in. And people are always getting big bounties from Facebook. Facebook seems to have quite a few errors having to do with the tokens to reset passwords and stuff, and every one of them is worth uh, pretty big payouts when they find them. Um, any place where it takes input that came from the user is a likely place where you'll be able to inject stuff. Um, the URL is obvious. You can type anything in the browser, anything in the query string. At the end of the URL is often there, post data, cook data, cookies, and forms. And other components will have places where you can put in data. At any place you can put in data, you might be able to do some kind of attack or make it do something unexpected. Um, <laughs> Find out what technologies are used on the server side. Want to know if they're using Java or ASP or whatever else they've got. And they might be getting input that doesn't come from directly from users, it comes from other things like email and such. So uh, here's all the places, the URL string, uh, every parameter, every cookie, and all the other headers. Uh, there were quite a few attacks like uh, um, Shellshock was a error in all applications using Bash where you could put a strange combination of parentheses and curly braces at the start of any parameter, including the user agent, and that would cause bash to declare an environment variable and you could run code in it. So you could inject a bash code by just putting funny characters in any field, like the referrer or the user agent, um, which is pretty awesome. And yeah, okay, anyway, and so uh, remember RESTful URLs put things that look like folder names, but they're really parameters, so that's another uh, thing to consider when you're modifying them. Um, and you can have parameters. Now the standard technique is this, like google.com q equals duck, but you can put it other ways. You can have semicolon and two different things here. You can have funny characters like percent 26 splitting them up, uh, percent three and all that jazz. Uh, you can have anything that your coder wants to do, to make. They could take that data and cut it up any old way and um, you need to see what they've got. And of course, if it's not something pretty common, then your automated processes will be lost and you're going to have to manually mess with them. Uh, the user agent tells you what the browser is. In principle, you could write a different version of the page for every version of browser, but most people don't care about that. But they do make a different version for mobile devices and phones because it, the main one looks like dirt. And uh, that's often a way to get in. And changing the user agent may show you different code. Also, of course, changing your user agent to a search engine will often show you a different version of the page. That's a common way to get free advertising, is to have content that's great, but you can only get it if you pay for it, but when you come in as Googlebot, they show it to you, so you appear in the search engine, and when people click on search and go there, now they want money. Yeah? A lot of exploit kids using this at their very first check, if it's vulnerable on that uh, user agent using, visiting the page. Yeah. The first thing you do is put uh, injection code in the user agent? So pretty much, it, it's just like uh, against like modern website, like yeah. modern browsers, mm -hmm. so they wouldn't expose the threat to everybody. So people who are actually <laughs> vulnerable to you will actually serve exploit kit. Otherwise, there's like no way to find there is an exploit kit. Oh, so the like exploit kit watches the user agent and then shows you like a control panel. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, okay, anyway. 
Yeah, that's that's. I found that to be true of, um, and in fact, PHP redirector at a professor's site. It looked at the user agents to decide whether to show to redirect you to a porn site or let you see the page. If you appeared to be coming from the college, you'd see the normal page and not know it was infected. But if you came from what appeared to be a search engine, then it would redirect you to a porn site. There's a lot of that. And so um, the headers will also tell you if it's behind a load balancer. You'll often see an X forwarded. So you can tell when things are behind a load balancer. And you can sometimes even predict the URL that will refer to just one item in the load, one, one server in the cluster, which is useful perhaps if you want to attack it with a DOS attack. Um, what about CDNs? X forwarded for is also a CDN. Yes, yes, CDNs, of course. Yes, you can see it. It's like Cloudflare. You can totally spot it in the way the URL is structured. And they add extra code to the page, too. Yeah. All right, and there are out-of-band channels. Other ways data is coming in, like email, things from WebDAV that's automatically uploading files. Your IDS might be sniffing things and sending alerts that end up on a page somewhere. Like I mentioned, that was a cute trick I saw from Troy Hunt. You could send someone an URL from like Toyota, because Toyota had this problem, with an apostrophe, and anybody that clicked it, it would then show up in the error log, which is visible. So you can trick data into going down the side channel and now see data you weren't supposed to see. And that's the game. Cell phone apps also have APIs, and data can come in there that also ends up on the main page. So this is typically how you exploit something. You find some way to get the data to flow in an unexpected way, so it passes by whatever security tests there might be. And I got a few more eye clickers. And one more set after these. Let's see this one. All right. So, which one of these is a phone scanner? All right, and it's Nikto. All right, named after an alien in a movie. Anyway. All right, which one tries every possible directory name? So I can quit at 25. I think the answers are in. All right, and that is uh, brute force. That they're calling it in this book. All right. All right. Where's an entry point for user input? All right, and that's the user agent is a place you can put an input. It's not where you normally do it, but if you use a proxy, you can modify it. All right, so server-side technologies. Let me make another attempt to get this thing out of the way. All right, um, all right so your server-side technologies, uh, you will typically when you connect to a server, you'll get a banner, and the banner often tells you everything, like what version of Apache, what version of Gzip, what version of OpenSSL. That's the way they're in by default. And if people don't know enough to change them, they give you all that information, which you really don't want to tell the whole world. Um, all right. You can also uh, tell from the way the web pages are formed, the comments, the structure. You can spot things like WordPress and Drupal and so on. Um, there are tools that will automatically try to fingerprint websites. All right. And HTTP recon is one mechanism in the book. It seems to me like it's a little bit old, but it's one option. Um, this will just send a bunch of requests and then compare it to some large database of how the different requests work. Wappalizer is the one I use. I learned it at a, um, at a web developer's class I took. Um, it just is a browser toolbar that adds a browser extension, and it automatically tells you what's used on every website. So it tell, and I don't know exactly how it works, but I think it's the same thing. So it tells you as much as it's able to figure out which version of Apache is being used and all the other technologies. So that's pretty handy. And um, by the way, like I mentioned, probably illegal. Technically, I'm learning information that they probably don't want me to have. And anyway, um, 
it is publicly available. Now, this is the way the whole the whole web is like people doing things that are technically illegal, but some of it just hasn't been prosecuted yet. You know, and that's the way it is. Wait, I can tell you two more tools. I've never heard of that tool. Yeah. Two more tools that is being used as intric intricately. Have you heard about that? Intric? I-N-T-R-I-C-A-T-E-L-Y. Intricately, okay. Let's see. This intricately, and valuable insight. Okay, let's see. It must be legal because, uh, and by the way, there's another one, Data Nine. Have you heard of Data, data Nine? That's the second one. N data Nine or if not? Data Nine. Okay. N Y Z E. These are the All right. Tools. These are good. Let's take a look. Data Nine. Yeah. Okay. Two tools that the industry is using. Well, see, now, they probably aren't helping you figure out what other people are using, right? They're no, no. So you go on a website and you can see exactly what they're using. Oh, sure. But all the technology. Everybody else. CDN. Oh, okay. Browser. Sales acceleration. That's not obvious from this. Yeah. That would be uh, technology tracking. Okay. Based on your prospect. Oh. So you go to their website. customer's website and figure yeah. out what they're using and you decide what to sell them. Yeah. Oh. So what load balancer they're using. But see, uh, just because they're doing it and selling it doesn't make it legal. It just means <laughs> nobody. <laughs> and the point is, the but CFA. Security is, vendors too, like F5. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, let me save these links. It's interesting. Data Nice is, is interesting. Uh, yeah, let's see here. Analyzes uh, other people's websites. Yeah. And I'll put it here. Uh, fingerprints websites. What it does. Fingerprints technologies. Yeah. So I mean, it's out there. But a whole lot of what's done in, especially in sales and marketing, is very questionably illegal. I mean, there's SEO optimization and stuff. Just a, a lot of them are pushing the edge. And there's a uh, you know, there's a wide gray area where you're technically legal, but you can get away with it because it's not a big enough crime that anybody really cares. And it just depends on how big of a stink you make about it. So if you manage to create a scandal, then somebody will actually do something about it. So intricately, again, fingerprint sites. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Those are good things to have around. It's good to know about them. So. And data nice. They're two competitors. Yeah, good. Thank you. So anyway, uh, the extensions of files will tell you what's going on. ASP is Microsoft Active Server Pages, JSP is Java, Cold Fusion, PHP, Perl, Python, DILLs, if you see them, those are compiled code running on Microsoft operating systems. <laughs> so these, if you know these, then you can just look at the URL and tell what, what technology is being used. Error messages are often far too uh, informative. They're all over the place. Um, this. Uh, it's better if you have a, an unrecognized file extension, you just get a generic message. But if it recognizes it, you'll often get a custom error saying you can't find it. Um, and I didn't have it. When I had it, I found it out. Somebody said they were hiring people at uh, Walmart. And they had a URL. When you clicked on the URL, it would give you one of these. So I thought that was pretty awesome. You know, the whole page, a whole giant page of source code and everything else. And I sent an email to a city college professor and spelled like, well, one letter wrong, and I got back 10 pages of source code from the email software and everything. Mm -hmm. I was thinking I was telling people to try that in the hacking group. Maybe it's, you get just tons and tons of information about all the email servers here when you do that. Um, anyway, they might have fixed it by now. So there's file extension mapping, different DILs that you touch. These are the system DILs used to process web input, and different DILs might lead to different error messages. You might be able to fingerprint which DILs are in use which can be handy if you know vulnerabilities in versions of Windows. Open Text is another product now called Vignette that uses this weird thing where you have a comma-separated list in the URL. Like I say, you can put the data anywhere in any form, and as long as your scripts find it, it's okay. This is the kind of stuff that wouldn't be here if the web was actually organized and polished. It's just everybody that has an idea just puts up a website using their screwy method, and if it gets popular, then it's another one of the 100 ways to make a website. Yeah. So if you're able to find out, okay, this site's using Apache version, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I mean, how useful is that? I mean, you're not going to necessarily know every vulnerability in <coughs> all versions. No, but you can Google for them. There's vulnerability <laughs> lists um, like that list them. Oh, and, I see. And, you can, and they often just have exploit code that you can just run that will just take over the site oh. or do something to it. So that's why if you have a, and there's, the, there's general tools like Metasploit. Metasploit has basically every patched vulnerability for anything common just in the list. Hmm. So. Um, if you are using an old version of something and it's old enough to have a serious problem, then <laughs> any script kitty can get in your site by just running automated attack without even knowing what they're doing. And that's a pretty serious problem. But 
That said, Apache used to have a ton of horrible frequencies, and it's not that weak anymore. So usually, you can be like a couple of years out of date, and if you look through the phones, none of them are really that bad. They're not like SQL injection where you take over the server. They're like a condition under which you might use up the CPU and freeze the website or something, but usually nothing too fatal. <coughs> Five or six years ago, there were lots of fatal vulnerabilities all the time, but they finally seem to have caught enough of them or improved their practices where they kind of, it's not so big anymore. Anyway, other things, Java servlets, uh, Oracle servers, something called Silverstream I've never used, but Ruby on Rails everybody's using, you'll see directory names like that. Session tokens often tell you the technology, Java sessions and ASP sessions and PHP sessions, put it right in the token, so just looking at the cookies and the tokens, you can tell what kind of technology they're using, and these things are automatically generated by the software, so almost everybody uses the same name. Um, and if code reuse is, of course, a huge issue. It's much more efficient for application developers rather than writing your own thing to just reuse somebody else's code, but then you inherit somebody else's sloppy coding practices and their vulnerabilities, so it's a problem. So often you'll find message boards in particular seem to be a huge one. People keep using old crappy message boards and not updating them. But every everything you have, your crypto libraries, your shopping libraries that way. So you find, here's the steps, you find entry points for user input, you look at the format, you find any other channels where you control the data coming in. This is to map the attack surface. Then you look at the banner to find out what they're using, look for other software identifiers, run fingerprinting tools, and look for these versions to see if there are known vulnerabilities in the software they're using. It is one of the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities of websites is that you use software with known vulnerabilities. It's very hard to avoid because you're using, like you saw that hackers on site is using about 25 different products. Are you really going to update all of them? Is there really some way you can tell that you updated all of them? Because probably somewhere in management, someone says, make sure you update everything. But is there really a way to check and make sure it's all updated? It could be like an all day project trying to figure out if all those things are really updated. And when you did, probably half of the things would break. <laughs> So how much work are you willing to, it'd be a whole lot cheaper to just buy like a web application firewall and pay like 10,000 bucks a year and call it done and never update your stuff, which is I think what most people do. <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, that's the game here. If I look at your URLs, a, like I said, HTT print seems to be kind of out of date, but there are other ones like Nmap and Netcraft and Shodan that will, and Wappalizer, that will fingerprint sites and a couple he mentioned. Um, so section tokens will give you a clue. Uh, Google or other, te other searching techniques will find out what they're using. And if you find any unusual cookie names or something, you can Google them and see if there's a product using that. I was quite surprised to find out that the DOD uses .NET Nuke, oh, really? a Microsoft-based technology center with a very unprofessional name, and it's they're part of the thing it's inherently popular. It's like sort of like WordPress, and it's got its administration panel and everything else. And it had horrible vulnerabilities just a few versions back, so I thought maybe all those wild things from Nicto were true, but they weren't. Anyway, so. Um, then you got server-side functionality. Like right here, you can see in the URL, at the end you see order by name. That strongly implies SQL, because SQL has the order by parameter. Uh, and over there it's got JSP, so that's Java. And it's got something called is expired equals zero. So maybe if you change that to one, you'll see something that's hanging around that's expired. That might be fun, you know, kind of obvious. Uh, here's another one, ASPX means it's Microsoft. A template appears to be a file name, and then there's a thing called location that is slash default. Now that suggests it's a directory, so you might be able to do directory traversal and wander to other directories you're not supposed to be in um, by just putting a path there. And onwards, there's something called edit equals false, so maybe if edit equals true, I'm allowed to write. That would be pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and there's version numbers, so changing version numbers might show me other versions of this thing, which again could be pretty awesome. You know, there's you just look for it. Here's posting for feedback form, and it's obviously making an email here. So this suggests it's letting me put the two desk help desk. Maybe I can send email to other people and send spam from their server. Maybe I can lie about the from address. So this is yeah. uh, post method, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, the post method. So it's not going to appear in the logs, but it's letting me specify something. Like if I have a comment on the help desk page. It shouldn't have me sending the help desk address up as a parameter. It should only be able to send to the help desk. This suggests that maybe I can send it somewhere else through their server. So this is in the header? So all this information about the parameters and Yeah, it's, it's not in the headers, it's in the body of a post request. Yeah. All right. Um, 
All right, and so again, you've got an action here that's view, so maybe that action could be edit or add or something. And there's an ID number of 117, so that strongly suggests that they're not random numbers, they're just counting up, so just try the other numbers, you might have something good happen. Um, if, your app, if your app is consistent, which it typically is, most people write like some standard routine and use it over and over. So if you have a SQL injection vulnerability, but you, your code is being filtered out, you might go to some other part of the code and see what the filter is. Because they might just use one filter for the whole site. So maybe comments go through the same filter or something, and you can find a way to see what it does. If the app obfuscates data in some way, you might try to find some place where you can see what it's doing. If they use one technique, they're probably going to keep using the same technique all over the place. And or you can use systematically varying values I've shown people this one pretty good. I didn't show you people this one in this class, did I? Oh, well, you ought to see it then. Let me, this is good, clean fun. Um, a few people have already seen it, but the, you can, here's an example of this, the Stitcher app. Stitcher is a music app that runs on Android, and these guys uh, wrote their own encryption routine to hide the password. Never do that. <laughs> Anytime you want to write crypto, just take a cold shower until the feeling passes. <laughs> And then go get a standard crypto library because if you think you're smart enough to write crypto, that just proves how stupid you are. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a small number of geniuses in the world that write crypto and you don't want to pretend to be that smart because you aren't and you will just be humiliated. <laughs> and your data will get stolen because you tried to write your own crypto instead of just trusting that the people that wrote the few things that are out there that are trusted really did put a lot of work into making it right. So here's good old burp. I go to the proxy, I turn off intercept. Okay, now let's see what uh, address burp is listening on, which is here. Okay, uh, I want it listening on all interfaces. So I'll edit this and listen on all interfaces. And that's going to be 147, 144, 204, 154. Okay, I might be able to remember that. Yeah, yeah, it's not safe. Your opinion has been noted. All right. Um, I already forgot it, though. Maybe you people remember. Let's see. So I have to go here in my Android cell phone. And here, I, that's not what I want. i got to hold this down until it gives me the other menu. There we are. Now I can do a manual 147, 144. And it's got to be this number, 204, 154. OK. So I'm telling it to send traffic through Burp, just like you did with your browser. 154, right? Okay, good. So I save that. Okay, now to test it, what I always like to do is go to AOL.com. That's a good thing. That's a good sign already. It, it can't go to this secure website. And what's going on here? Oh, I got to cancel this and go here, there. Okay, it can't go to the website, so I'm going to view certificate. And it's a port trigger certificate, which is the people who made Burp, so I know it's working. My traffic is now being man in the middle by Burp. Okay, so I can't get to websites if they're secure, which is fine. I want to go back. Okay, go back, go back. All right, stop bothering me. Okay, now, Stitcher is here. Okay, so Stitcher is a music app. Okay, now, uh, at some kind of ad page loaded with HTTP. So I'm going to sign, I'm going to log in, and my username is sam at AOL.com. And my password is P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D, and I log in. So when I log in, let's see how it sent that data. Well, it sent it with no encryption at all, <laughs> or so you would think. At least it did not use HTTPS. However, I said, well, back can probably steal the username and password. And down here, we'll see what Burp found. It, um, you can read it in this messy form, but it's more fun to let Burp parse it out for you. Burp will parse out the, Burp will parse out the parameters and lay them out in a friendly format. So that one is a post request. This one is a get. There we are. This is the one that's logged in. Email, Sam at AOL. EPX is the password. And look at this junk. TM5K. It is encrypting the password somehow. It didn't send P-A-S-S-W-R-D. Now, I've seen a lot of these. And sometimes I can figure out what they're doing, and sometimes I can't. So you might think this might not be so bad. Now, they could be using HTTPS, which would just use the standard libraries written by somebody else. But they wrote their own encryption routine. So we'll see if we can defeat their encryption routine. So I tried a simple password, like A. And then you get SN. So A turns into SN. That's not a good sign. You know, a proper hashing or encryption routine would keep it a fixed length, like an MD5 or something, and apparently doing something simpler than that. So let's try B. And when I send B, you get SO. 
Oh, okay. So you, some, some of you might be getting to detect a pattern here. So if I use C, <laughs> See, you're already defeating their custom routine, which they thought was so clever. Uh, yeah, if I put C, I get SP. <laughs> okay. So, so let's move forward into like more advanced challenges like AA. So if I do AA, I get SN5K. So does it lock you out after some of the wrong tries? No, not at all. It never seems to lock me out. You can do this all day. Um, they, they, they were too smart to do that too. So, so let's try AB. And AB um, is SN5L. So what's going on is this is always an S, this is always a 5. Half of it is just fixed. This is the seizure cycle. This has moved forward like 10, 15 characters in the alphabet. This has moved forward by a different amount. This is a slightly modified seizure cipher. Yeah. Now, this was military grade encryption 2,500 years ago, <laughs> but not in the modern world. And this is, you know, I just thought I mentioned this is the kind of thing you can do. You'll find patterns where there shouldn't be patterns. If they had just not been smart and just used HTTPS, then some other geniuses would have figured out how to make some beautiful encryption scheme that would be a whole lot better than this. Anyway, um, I remember one of these guys, I don't know if it's this company or another, I called him, I, I sent him a vulnerability disclosure about this, and they said, well, what should we use? And I said, there's something called HTTPS. And they said, what's that? And I'm like, <laughs> I said, well, I can see why things are so bad over there. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I forget which one. I notified a lot of companies of this kind of stuff. Anyway, um, but they're doing it because they think what they're doing is good enough, you know, and they they're people that are, and, and there's people, especially in the cryptocurrency space, there's people who have, are unaware of how stupid they are. They don't even have a clue. Anyway, um, so another thing you have errors that give you too much. Yeah, this is it. This is Walmart. They sent me an email, sent your students to get a job at Walmart, and when I clicked on it, I got this. Wow, this is bloody awesome. Wow. Source code, line yeah. numbers, everything else. And a few years ago, the Republican National website was the same. I put an apostrophe to the URL, I got this, and I said, you know, I think I'll quit poking around here. Um, so, obviously, you don't want to do that. You should turn off custom, you have custom error messages that just say, I'm sorry, there's a problem, here's our help page, or something like that. <laughs> Not this kind of garbage. Because this tells me all kinds of stuff I don't need to know. Um, all right, so look for unique application behavior, see if it's got a consistent framework, and then try to find things that are obviously bolted on later that weren't passed through the checks of the framework. like in testing they decided you had to have another module so we put it on captchas debugging functions things that have a different gui appearance that isn't as pretty were like stuck on by somebody else or not really passed through the code review you know there's a lot of clues that you're getting into the bad part of town where the mistakes are going to be yeah I'm curious about the captcha is, like, yeah. is that effective in any way the captchas are quite effective yeah. if you don't have a captcha people write scripts to automatically try a thousand logins or something if you have a captcha it greatly slows them down now captchas are not perfect and especially the Russian hackers are very good at defeating captures. They've defeated almost everything, like Yahoo and Gmail. But it, it, it's like any other security measure, it raises the bar. Now, a bunch of people that would just be breaking into the simple Python script have to have like an AI script to break through the capture. It's more expensive for them to get in now. So I mean, it matters. Um, of course, I, even, I had a caption on my website for a long time that was just always the letter C, nothing else. It was always a horse. I had a picture, what's this, it's a horse, it never was a horse. That protected me for like five years until an actual angry hacker got mad at me, somebody from the uh, Jaded Security podcast. They targeted me and my students to prove that we're stupid and should be run out of the business, which was a real popular activity about three or four years ago. Somehow they seem to have gotten tired of it. But anyway, he, he got his friends to write a script specifically targeting my site and they froze up on the servers here for about an hour. Um, so, you know, even a really lame CAPTCHA stopped a certain kind of attack. But the, uh, you know, a proper Google CAPTCHA will stop more of them. Yeah? We're against CAPTCHA, but I, I guess we'll, we'll just... We'll, well, CAPTCHA uh, is this, annoying to the users. There's a service called Death by a CAPTCHA. Um, yeah. They can actually send the CAPTCHA via API call. Somebody yeah. somewhere is going to solve it. And There's also it. Mechanical Turk. You can just get people to solve CAPTCHAs for yeah. like a penny each. Yeah. So, yeah, CAPTCHAs are not perfect by any means. 
And, and what oh, Google's so been moving to, huh? now Google has this thing, just check this to prove you're not a robot. Now they're moving to more subtle things, like noticing how many seconds it takes you to click it, because if you were a robot, it would be one-tenth of a second if you're human. So that that's the new hotness, is not irritating the user so much, but noticing in subtle ways that it's a human. But none of these are perfect. And this is why, you know, the original point of the Turing test was to prove when a human, when AI is smart enough to pass for a human. And we've been past that in many ways. Like Elijah, even in the 60s. Elijah was like the first chat bot that would just do like Rogerian therapy. You'd say something, you'd say, oh, tell me more about it. Oh, do you think it has to do with your mother? It's simple answers that could always match anything. And but the guy that wrote it found that his secretary had a relationship with him. She was telling her secrets. She was closing the lid when he came in the room. And it really is enough to fool you. And this is, you know, if you go to a party and like chat people up, you can just follow an algorithm. Like you don't need to actually listen. You can just, just it makes you this idea that you talk to humans and you have a meeting of the minds and you exchange this deep knowledge of their consciousness. The evidence is not there. You know, you pretty much just use an algorithm and pass for a human. Anyway, um, there's big issues on both sides of that. What really is a human and not a robot? The robots are getting smarter, and the humans are actually doing really simple algorithms a lot of the time instead of this brilliant creative thinking that we like to pretend we're doing. Anyway, so uh, if you have file uploading and downloading, you're likely to be able to do pass traversal or put content in the file that will run that stored XSS. If you have display of user data, you get XSS, where you can put up something active and bounce it onto another user. And dynamic redirects are a big deal, where one page goes to another, you can now trick it into going to other pages and you can therefore attack someone and have it blamed on this company, or you can get it to add content from another page into it. Um, social networking features uh, often have sort of cross-site scripting, and login forms, of course, are subject to enumeration of usernames, at least. If they tell you if that email is registered or not, you can find a list of all the valid emails by just trying them. And, of course, passwords and brute force attacks can be gotten in. If you have um, two- or three-factor authentication, then there are often logic flaws that break it. Um, there was a, something that hit the news about a year and a half ago. It was in like 2600 and on Reddit and stuff. There was a way to get into anybody's account because if you called the Yahoo help desk, they would ask you for like someone's address and then they would give you like the last four of their social or something. And you could take the last four of their social and call Amazon and ask for a reset. And they would, they would tell you something else. And if you called some other third company like Google or something, the different information they used would overlap in such a way <laughs> that you could get everything you needed to get in someone's account. And this kind of thing keeps happening. You see how it will happen in the chaotic world. Um, all right. And uh, your access controls will have a horizontal and vertical privilege escalation. Horizontal escalation is where you move from your account to someone else's account. And vertical escalation is where you move from user account up to administrator. And both of these can be possible if there are errors in the access controls. And, uh, or you can impersonate users. And of course, clear text communications will be leaking out secrets. Um, and off-site links may leak query stream. That's a cute one. I, don't, I was so horrified when I found out about refer. So if you go to a site, and you go to another site, it tells them where you came from. Now the idea, I guess, is to see if your ads are effective, but it means you're getting information about other sites. And if they didn't use post, and they put sensitive data in the URL, it's actually sent to other <coughs> servers everywhere you go. So it's kind of unsanitary. And you know, I imagine if you put your browser in like private mode, that it would quit sending refer headers, at least I hope so, yeah. If you use HTTPS, then you shouldn't be sending refer headers. It's only for HTTP. That's a good question. I don't know. I haven't tried it. I, I believe it's not going to be there for HTTPS. I would like to. That's a good, that makes sense, but it'd be interesting to see. That, that was a big deal back yeah. when Google switched from using HTTP to HTTPS for searches. So now you can't track your ads. People who got someone from Google didn't know what they searched for. Yeah, so that's right. That should mean that yeah. if you use HTTPS, I know Cloudflare had the same issue uh, because if Cloudflare is a content delivery network and you load your page from there, then you don't know that someone clicked on your ad. So there's a mod Cloudflare you put that will take a signal. They do send a signal to your server saying someone touched the page. So you can count the click. Because that's the problem. Cloudflare sits in front of your server and people just see the copy of the server and you don't know. So you don't get to count the click. So there's a special Apache module you can put in to interpret requests that come from Cloudflare. You can turn on an alert every time someone views your page on Cloudflare. It's a similar issue. Anyway, um, as the error messages leak out too much and native code may have buffer overflows and error like that, compiled code, and uh, if you can identify the web, web server and the other technologies, 
then you're liable to find uh, known bugs. So here's an example. Uh, if you go to auth directory up there, it's got your bit password, reset password, and all that. So that's a place you test things like session handling. Core site stats is uh, up there. That's got a page ID with a long list of parameters. So you might try wildcards up there and varying them. Something in there looks like a directory, so you might wander through that. And then there's home. This is the authenticated user content down here, so you might try accessing these pages and see if they all really verify that you're logged in and things like that. That's horizontal privilege escalation. Icons and images are static content, but you're probably not going to find anything fun there. It's probably just sitting there. Um, pub is restful resources under the public side. Um, there, pub media user 11, 13, 18. Uh, you might try changing the numerical value to go there to see if something's fun there. And shop is online shopping. And down here you have a whole bunch of things, a uh, whole bunch of books for sale, and you, you might find logic flaws down there. It's just how you guide yourself in looking for flaws. It can be a very big job, of course, like a forensic analysis. You just have to get experience and learn how to quickly focus on things that matter and not end up wasting too much time going down blind alleys. All right. So, I click. Yeah. So, my group in the software engineering class wants to create an eye clicker app. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out how to do it. Would you mind if I filmed you doing Oh, feel free. Because then I'll show them how to actually sure, sure, use it. Yeah. The software is free and it's really miserable. It's full of bugs. Yeah. So I bet um, another student, I, he wants to, he wants to get a shell on my machine by taking over my machine through the eye clicker. And that <laughs> could very well be possible. It's pretty crappy software. It's not encrypted. It's 900 megahertz. That that's, sounds possible. There's already somebody that wrote a blog and said they figured out how to like override people's votes and change things and add extra votes. and you, It's not in any way secure. You probably do a lot of fun things. Anyway, so which extension here tells you that the web server uses Windows? Looks like the answers are in. All right, and that's ASP for active server pages. That's the Microsoft technology. All right. So, which one tells you that it's used in Perl? All right, let's see. Yep, the answers are in. That's PL, obviously. Good. Which one is compiled C code? Yeah, coming in good and fast. All right. That's dynamic link libraries there. Those are compiled C or C++ typically. Not Java, not CFM, that's uh, Cold Fusion. All right. Uh, are DILs, or Windows DILs. DILs are Windows yeah. libraries, shared libraries, <coughs> and they're compiled. So but the question is, um, just is suggesting that they're also, it's also used by C. Um, oh no, typically they're written in C, and then compiled on Microsoft servers. Yeah, yeah. yeah can't. Yeah, DILs. Uh, not, Python would be mm -hmm. C. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, a Python file you compile C. That's interpreted. Python. Oh yes, Python is the Python server, but that doesn't end in .py. Yeah. So there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. Uh, so which one tells you the job is being used? All right. All right. And that's of course uh, okay. servlet. Yes, right. Thank you. Good. Java servlets, Java applets and Java servlets are these things they make. <coughs> All right, now which one would give you a clue that they're using SQL? <coughs> All right, I guess I'm Whoa, they're okay now. All right. <laughs> order by, order by is there. And I wonder if this would work. Let me just try something because it's such good, clean fun. Um, this is if you do in URL, select.
from. I think that'll do it. Yeah. Um, uh, let's try. Let's try. In URL order by me. Let's try that order. Percent twenty by. Yep. There you go. There you go. Um, that looks like one. And database for law enforcement enablement. Well, there you go. From IBM.com. Um, and look at that URL. That's actually that's actually okay. It's a page about order by. Let's see. What, some of the, some of these are actually print bankrupt mail order buyers. Yeah, that's it. This is a file with SQL in the name. And this is a company selling some kind of product. And here's some company selling some jar. See, this is it. This is what somebody has done. They've got a, uh, they've got a shop selling something to do with Jaguars. And this is how they make their product display. They just put the SQL right up there. <laughs> so you could just put drop table. Um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you could just upload a PHP shell like you did in the SQL injection homework and take over their server. Uh, here's another one, mail order senior buyers order. And you could, there's a, there are like 200 of these, and I tried this a couple of years ago, 200 websites that have live SQL in the URL. This is not even SQL injection, the SQL is just right there. <laughs> so this is, I don't know what you can do about these people, but um, you could certainly commit enough felonies for a long jail term in a hurry by just playing around with the URL there. Anyway, so um, a lot of stupidity like that goes on. Anyway, let me quit this thing and I'll see who won the uh, iClickers. So this is 129S, Chapter 4B.